You can see that? Yeah. Just coming up. Okay. Yeah. Um, right, well, hello, I'm Paul. I've been doing this sort of thing. So I just run up and down the stairs to get my phone. I didn't have a timer <laughs> uh, for a very long time. Um, it started when I was seven years old, really, with three questions. Why are we so cruel to each other? How can one species, apparently without a second thought, be making other species extinct? And then when I saw the first ever photograph of planet Earth ever in the universe, um, I thought everything I know is on this. Everything I'll ever know is on this ball, this amazing blue ball. And it seems to work perfectly well until, are you, rec are you recording, Caroline? Yes, I'm recording. Yeah, everything seems to work perfectly well until humans come along, yet we are a species. So we must have a part somehow. We must like other species have a part. I wonder what that is. Where do I fit in? Where do we fit in? Where do humans fit in? And this is an illustration from um, my, not my first, but very early job in conservation as a countryside ranger and education officer on the Suffolk Heaths, uh, where I, where just to show you, this question has been with me all my life. Um, so I first trained as a countryside ranger instead of doing A-levels at Agricultural College. Got into education, environmental education because of these questions. Everything, every step I've taken has been in order to, to um, further my understanding of these questions. Where do we fit in? Why are we so cruel to each other? Why are we making species extinct? So it took me from conservation to uh, research to a degree in anthropology because I felt I know the ecology now, and I think a really important part of being an ecotherapist is to understand ecology. That pyramid that Caroline showed of Bazell, I, when you showed that Caroline, I thought of that as being, to be a therapist, an ecotherapist, depends on not just respect for, but knowledge of the ecosystem as though these are kind of dependent, like a dependent holarchy. So I felt I needed to know about it, about the, the cultural belief systems in order to understand these questions. I was in research in universities for a number of years, uh, but felt constrained there and eventually, and also the psychological dimension started to become more and more important, which is when I trained as a psychotherapist and uh, always with the ecological on the one hand and this what is essentially a try I, I i think in terms of transpersonal ecotherapy transpersonal ecopsychology because that's the part that addresses the question of where do i fit in not just how can how can uh, the the environment nature the ecosystem be a kind of resource for my own personal experience but how does the reciprocity work whereby what I take from that, I give back because I'm part of it. So what is the calling uh, that I have as part of it? And um, all of this, I just in, in preparing for this, I started to have, it's a question, what is ecotherapy that prompts an inquiry? into what healing and being whole is, because therapy comes from the Greek meaning healing, health and healing. In turn, health and healing come from Old English meaning wholeness and being whole, that you can almost trace a, um, a thread through that points me anyway towards what ecotherapy is, wholly connected with wholeness, that's the same root. And then the eco part, the relatedness of all things. It, it comes from the Greek meaning ekos, house, dwelling place, habitation. 
and a, quote above the household more than the household in other words it refers to our context it's not all about me it refers to context and system i like to use the word ecosystem um comes from the greek meaning an organized whole a compound a compounded parts how do the the parts hold together as one whole it's very easy as you said caroline to delude ourselves that we're separate well we are distinct just as any other species is distinct but we're not separate and this is a key uh, psychological block really that we need to come through if we're going to come through the ecological i call it ecological holocaust that we're in because when 70 percent of insects 60 percent of animal populations have declined in the last 40 years that's holocaust scale and i have that in my own background the holocaust with a capital h and i almost feel it's part of my calling to bring to bring that way of thinking about what we're going through in into this so healing and holding not just of me but as me as an as embedded within this bigger within this bigger system ecosystemic therapy that's what this is to me <clears throat> and i noticed as i was doing this that there are two ways that the that the word therapy or different therapies are used and one is um, where it refers to what is being healed, uh, which is in the purple. And the other is what we are using to do the healing. <laughs> this strikes me to be quite a helpful way of thinking of the, the type one and the top, type two psychotherapies. So one is using nature in order to work with the psyche. And the other is working through the psyche as a way because I'm part of nature and I have nature within me to heal the ecosystem. I just wanted to sort of draw attention to that really. Um, so like this, ecotherapy, nature therapy, two ways of thinking about it. Nature as instrument, in, or outer nature as instrument, and in a sense, inner nature as an instrument to heal the outer. Outer to heal the inner and inner to heal the outer. But actually, of course, it's systemic and it's all one. And true ecotherapy is about remembering that, that interrelatedness. Ecology, for me, is about the understanding of the relatedness of all things. And that refers both to psychotherapy and ecotherapy. <clears throat> so when we look at this, this cliche, I mean, it's a cliche these days, isn't it? Earth. Oh, not an image of the planet Earth. What a cliche, you see it all the time these days. But for billions and billions of years, there was no image of it. This is, we have done this as a species. It's, this reflects our capacity to actually see, not just ourselves, but to be the universe seeing itself because that's where we come from. You know, the Big Bang evolved all this diversity and complexity to the point where it's produced this species, and maybe other species can do it too, but we can only do it as a human does it, that can be the universe actually thinking about itself and wondering where we fit into it in a conscious way. So what do you see here? Is it a resource? Um, is it a an aesthetic? Is it, in what way, does it have meaning? Is, does it have meaning because it's a resource, because it's an aesthetic? Or does it have meaning because you can say, as it says in the book of Genesis, wow, isn't it good? And I'm part of this. I wonder what part I play. Every other species just does it. But somehow we have to ask, we, part of what we have to do is, is discern it for ourselves. Where do I fit in to the ecosystem? 
what is my calling to use the old transpersonal spiritual wisdoms what am I, what is being asked of me it's a really interesting meditation to do this what do i see what is it to me it's like a mandala or a yantra um so gosh time flies doesn't it so basically i'm seeing there are two in, in my writing which you can access um there's a you can access it um it's the that instinctive am i going to survive orientation a sort of pre-personal that the ego orientates towards how am i going to survive how am i going to protect myself how am i going to reproduce and reproduce myself in all of these different ways that we do in not just biologically but culturally it's resource seeking and it's a loud insistent voice that the culture around us which i think reflects and i explain this in my writing reflects that basic instinct of i me mine basically i me mine and it's that it's that that's the default that we share with every other species and then there's this other one that the ego can orient towards instead but it takes a lot of will a lot of choice that integrating one that conscious reflection that we just did for a moment with the planet and that we can we can orientate our lives around that so it's myself but also orientated to the to what we experience as other actually is us which is why i put in that i am that i am an ancient wisdom saying it's context seeking finding meaning through context appreciative and it's a very still small voice within so it's a, this is a question i think of uh, the, the evolution of life on earth the evolution of earth from a non-conscious big bang sort of unity to a conscious unity through the harmony of the evolved parts which we as humans have to choose we, we're not just going to do it we have to it takes evolution takes on a kind of a different key in some way so how can we fit in and thereby find more meaning existential emotional psycho spiritual meaning in life by through discerning place our part our role as persons and species and we've spent millennia trying to convince ourselves of this i won't go into that now but it's there in all the ancient wisdoms basically and a lot of that is my what i orientate towards and take inspiration from so what does your ecosystemic conscience tell you about your earth shadow? This is a, a, a 16th century alchemical picture of the earth with all life comes from the sun and we cast the shadow. These are just giving you some clues about my approach here too, but I won't go into that either. And this, this can become um, a, an actual everyday psycho-spiritual practice. Um, all we have to do is consider our everyday small choices that are actually quite big when they accumulate that have become habits and ask to what extent do they contribute to or 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 um both your own sense of place but also the integrity of the bigger body that you're part of or to what extent do they contribute to the disintegration and this image is is it fragmentation or is it finding your place? And these are just some examples which you can look at at your leisure when you get the overheads, because you're quite welcome to have these show my age there slides. Uh, and some links to some really important ecological documentaries that I've that have inspired me. They're very old, which just shows how long it takes for us to think about these things and some of my articles and that's 12 o'clock i wanted to tell you about an amazing I, I, I the cat caught a mouse this morning that's nature i went into the woods i found people doing ecotherapy in the woods i had so many it was such a good example this morning of what i'm trying to say but i haven't got time to say it unfortunately maybe in a 
in a plenary. It was amazing. It's amazing how we can reflect on every little thing that happens when we start to understand ecology in a way that in also includes human action and decisions and and actions. Yeah. So thanks. There we go. Um, stop share. Thank you very much, Paul. That was very rich. <laughs> if you're if you have your PowerPoint as a PDF, then you could share it into the chat line and people can download it for themselves. Oh, that's a good idea. Do I'll do that. Yeah. OK, so without more ado, Vanessa. How, how do I follow that one? The, the, the coin sounds phrase. Whoa. So I'm taking that from a very, um, I'm taking it from a di very different sort of perspective. I've gone very practical. Um, so I'm, I'm Vanessa. Um, I trained with Tariki a couple of years ago with quite a lot of the people that are on, on the screen. My background is a um, nursery teacher. Um, um, and I work for the local authority and I have sort of changed the things. So Tariki came at a point in my life where I needed to change, where I needed to move things forward. I've trained as a, um, in the past year as a coach, an Indian head massage, a, uh, a, 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 a well-being. I'm a forest school practitioner. I work with children. I work with adults. I work with people with mental health. I work with babies. I have a sort of portfolio of things, but what are the things that, that, that really runs through all of it is being out in nature so that, that when I went, I first went into a wood as part of my, my forest school training, um, I cried and I couldn't work out why every time I went into a wood I burst into tears and thought there's something about this I need to follow it through. So I've, I'm, I've got a bit of a screen, a screen um, to share with you. Um, I've got 10 minutes so and I've got and I've already had well a minute of it a little bit over so I shall, with further ado, I shall share my screen. Um, so here we are. Let's have a see. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. what is it? So I was, I was asking, what, what is it? And um, yeah, it's been really inspiring listening to the people that have spoken so far. But I've gone a very sort of practical, a practical way to this. So, what is it? Um, I can't do this, 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 this on my own. I need to have people to, to, to do it with me. So this mad woman in the woods um, is going to help me a little bit um, with it. She knows more about it than me. It's before I had my hair cut. So I'll let her speak. <clears throat> so hi, I'm uh, Vanessa and I'm one of the directors of Athalas CIC. And I'm here in the woods uh, this morning, just run a session with some children and I thought I'd do you a video of, of our woods, to, just take a little bit of a walk around them to show you where we are, so that when you come, you, you're not coming to a place that you, you don't, you don't recognise, which is quite scary coming somewhere you don't perhaps know. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in the woods. So you won't be seeing any more of me, you'll see the woods, not me. So I shall uh, turn this round and uh, take you on a tour of our woods. So she, she, she's my counter because she works in the woods. That was a, a, as a, a video that we sent out to in lockdown to um, uh, all our participants because we work, we work in the woods with people with mental health problems on a couple of, on a couple of um, um, programs. And yeah, um, going to a woods with some people that you've never met before and you'll feel better. Uh, most scariest thing that was said to one of our participants, she was sent by the job centre, she was um, listening, it was, it was interesting talking to one of the people in, in the breakout groups, she was a victim of domestic violence, she had a, a sons with special needs, she was a long term unemployed, she had uh, a lot of mental health issues herself, and she came and sat on a, um, sat in the bench, she'd been sent by the job centre because it would do her good to go out into the woods, and she sat and she was like a little bird. She literally sat like a little bird and she was sitting there and thinking, um, who are all these people? And I saw her a year later after the program and she said, the one thing that really made a difference to me was the fact that you came over and you said, 
do you want a cup of tea? And we lit, a, lit the fire and we, um, and we talked and she said, I had to do this. I had to open up and I had to take the cup of tea. But at no, no point did I ever say to her, and by the end of today, you'll have, you'll have carved a spoon, you'll have done a spatula, you'll know all the tree identification, you will have done all this and you will feel better. I said, just come to the woods and just be here. She'd wander off, she'd do things. Um, and it, it, it's sort of how we changed. So we started doing stuff on video so that we could actually re reach people again. So is, for me, is ecotherapy this? Um, bear with me. Yes, I filled what uh, two minutes of my of my presentation with just trees. But to, to me, there is a lot about coming into a wood and coming and being in that space. I work with children on a Thursday afternoon who've got um, emotional behavioural difficulties, uh, autistic on the ASD spectrum, um, who come into the woods like rampaging. Why, being very unkind, I was calling them rampaging little gremlins last week, as they come in and they smack trees and they rip up things. Um, and one little boy stood and he, he was watching these, these, these trees um, moving around. And I wished I could take a video of him, but obviously I'm not allowed to do that because he was one, his, his language is, is, is violent, his whole, and he stood and he just went, oh, and he just, the whole body just relaxed. Everything about him just relaxed. I had a little boy um, on Thursday who wrapped himself with a rope to a tree and screaming, I won't say exactly what he said because it was full of very foul language. I don't want to be, well, I'll say, I don't want to leave the fucking woods. And he, he literally was pulled off a tree to go back to a classroom in a box. And yet what he knows about, I found out about um, devils, devils, I can't even remember what they were, a fantastic, a, a beetle. He knows all about it. He told me more about it. He told me that Ladybirds had sticky things on their feet that they can sit, they can walk upside down. And yet he goes back, a bit of jumble. So this is me again. Well, it's not, it's actually my alter ego, but um, she's got something to say as well. <laughs> so sometimes we have to do things that we don't particularly want to do. We might have to go out in nasty weather. We might have to have a meeting with somebody that we don't particularly want to do. We might, do you know what, just have, want to get to go out of bed or not. And we all have days like that. But uh, the reality isn't always that bad. Although it is cold and it's uh, wet, it's beautiful jewels on trees. So that was me walking, in, in, walking the dog um, a few weeks ago trying to persuade people to go outside in the rain. I finished that video with, I'm sure I'm not going to convince you on this day to walk outside, but I actually enjoyed going out there. And I had Caroline on my shoulder the whole time going, look at that tiny little you know, drop of rain on that on there. Look at this and um, notice the water. I've got videos and videos of, of water, all different ways of water flowing. Um, and going out and, and, and just experiencing these things for ourselves. So is it being outside in nature or as one of my participants on the first one saying, being in a wood with a bunch of nutters and she'd been told, like I say, to go into the woods and she says, I'm in, the, I'm in the woods with a bunch of nutters and they've all got knives. And when somebody says that to you, when you know that they have got a, a diagnosis of all sorts of different things, 
you think, mm, where am I going with it? But those people really, really got so much out of it. One man um, whittled 12 matchsticks, a 12 week program, he went and whittled 12 matchsticks and he went home with 12 little pieces of, paper, pieces of, of wood. Um, so I said ecotherapy, um, am I walking the dog or um, am I actually doing something for things? So here that woman again. So I've just passed a lady with another dog and uh, she said it's not the right weather for doing this, why do we have dogs? And then she answered her own question straight away, which I thought was lovely. I want to share it with you. She said, yes, but it clears your head coming out in weather like this. It clears your head. Just being where the dog is. Um, and it does. Feel fresher. Feel like you've done something. And I'm going to go back in and treat myself to a hot chocolate. But I feel like I've, I've done something. I didn't want to come out. But I would have missed some of these wonderful things that I've seen, which I was just trying to share with you. So just to finish, just to, com to complete that, I've just got a couple of images that I want to share with you. And I'm just going to read some of the comments from my from our practitioners, from our, the people that have come on the clients, on the group. I don't have to put on a persona. I can just be myself. I'm just accepting for me. No one's drilling me on what I should be doing or feeling, asking how I feel or how does that make you look? Sitting in a room, I always think of, of, of Caroline when I say that, this, the, the room and the pot plant. We can do our own thing. It's made a massive difference, a huge, 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 humongous difference. I never want to leave when I'm here. It fires me, it's great. There's no judgment, I can just be. And this is from Stuart, who came on our year long programs just finished. And he said it helped me mentally, physically and spiritually, because even on the darkest days, the Friday group gave me something to look forward to. I didn't always think I'd make it through the week, but I had Friday to look forward to coming here. It got me out of bed. It's helped me with confidence, being able to talk to other people. She's even he's even met somebody on the course. He's getting married next year to one of the other participants and we're happy together. I used to take my son to school and go home to bed and get it back into bed. That was my day. But I have to get organised, get, get a bus. It's helped me relax my mind and my body. It's got a lot of rid attention for me. Um, you might as well give it a go. And I brought other people to the setting. So there's a couple of images of our woods that we have and things that we've made with people in the woods. And I want to just finish with just one poem. I know I've got sort of we're over a little bit, but I'll start a little bit later. So um, finish with one, one poem, which is Miroslav Holub um, a poem that says, go and open the door. Maybe outside there's a tree or a wood, a garden or a magic city. Go and open the door. Maybe a dog's rummaging. Maybe you'll see a face or an eye or the picture of a picture. Go and open the door. If there's a fog, it will clear. Go and open the door. Even if there's only the darkness ticking, even if there's only the hollow wind, even if nothing is there, go and open the door. At least there'll be a draft. So that's me. <clears throat> oh, thank you so much, Vanessa. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, and so Charlotte. Hi everyone. Um, thanks for the, um, uh, it's been really lovely. Sorry, I can hear myself echoing. From um, it's been lovely hearing everybody's uh, talks and that was really lovely, Vanessa. Um, so I thought I'd just talk a little bit about um, my background and then a bit about how I work and then hopefully if we've got some time at the end, I've got some pictures. Um, so I initially trained as a doctor um, and I specialised in psychiatry. Um, I've been a trustee for MIND. Um, I left psychiatry to do um, holistic therapy. Um, oh yeah, that's better, thanks. Uh, to do holistic therapy um, and tarot reading. 
and then I trained in counselling uh, with Tariki, so I did the counselling diploma. Um, and I've done some ecotherapy modules and uh, run some workshops and things. So, um, and my my background really with um, relationship to nature begins with my grandmother and being brought up with uh, modern witchcraft and tarot uh, with her. So we used to celebrate the seasonal festivals and we'd go outside a lot, particularly at night time. Um, and we do lots of rituals based on the time of the year um, so we'd talk about getting you know releasing things or um, speaking to ancestors around sowing in October and we'd celebrate new life and new things in the spring um, and then I started doing shamanism later on a few years ago um, and uh, although my focus shifts fairly regularly the the most um, enduring thing is always about relationship between me and the natural world um, and I wanted to tell you about a big shift I had once when um, it was a, several years ago now when I was on a shamanic retreat and we were asked to think of a skill um, a skill that we had that we could somehow share with nature and uh, I was racking my brains because at the time I was very down on myself and I uh, thought I don't have any skills but then eventually I uh, realised that I could listen, you know, and that is a skill that I have. So um, I went out and I put my hands on the ground and listened really intently to the earth. And I had this sudden welling up of energy and emotion and connectedness and, um, but also an awareness as if, as if the earth had noticed me. So there was this intimate interaction. And since then, I've, I've developed that interaction um, in my work and in my, just my natural life, in my normal life and, um, uh, and for my own mental health. Um, so when I go walking, I like to, I'll find, often find a special tree that I particularly like or a special place. And I'll create a mandala or something from natural objects that I've found around and about. And to me, that feels a bit like a marking of the place, but it also feels like I'm thanking the tree or thanking the place. And then I like to think that people might walk past and see it, and then they know it's a special place. And I, I start to imagine that places like Stonehenge or Bridget's Wells in Ireland or um, Chalice Well in Glastonbury, and that they were somehow became a strange attractor that it started with somebody just leaving a mark one day and then another person realised it was special and then eventually lots of people made it special and realised it was special and then people travel all over the world to Stonehenge and Newgrange and Chalice Well um, and I also like to collect objects um, <clears throat> so I often come home with feathers or rocks or things and I, I make new things from them so I make um, I make wands for people out of sticks that I find special sticks. So um, and I see a wand as a focusing of natural power of, of somebody's own power. And I joke that they're their perfect weapon. And I, I gave um, a friend a perfect weapon once, and then we fell out. And I, I sometimes think that I I've given her the the means with which to uh, to harm me. But never <laughs> mind. Um, uh, and I think that these objects are like an anchor, so I make natural altars at home or, and I build them up with candles and um, feathers and rocks and shells and whatever sorts of things I've found, or I do spells with them and I'm, um, or I journey with them and some of the workshops um, that I've run. So one of my particular focuses over the last few years has been the moon. Um, which I like to think about the ancestral connection with the moon and that people would have, um, the early people would have noticed the moon waxing and waning and changing and being in different places at different times of the year and people develop mythology around it and, um, you know, their deities and all sorts of things. Um, and uh, and I work with that in terms of cycles. So if, if the moon is waning, 
I use it to make spells or rituals about releasing things that don't serve me anymore. And I encourage other people to do the same uh, using workshops. Um, we've, uh, some of the workshops I've done, we've worked through difficult emotions using the moon as a backdrop and the cycles. So we've worked through things like regret and guilt and um, or honoring a part of yourself, you know, even when you're feeling low and you don't think you're worth anything, that you, there's always something that can be honored and you do that at the full moon. And at the dark moon, um, you take time, take time to relax and reflect and have quiet time. Um, we've done some astral travel, we've um, used objects to do astral travel, we've, um, we've looked at time and how natural world runs more in cyclical or, or spiral time rather than linear time. Um, I've used food and rituals, so um, I once uh, ran a ritual with um, using an apple for Inanna's journey into the underworld. And we all uh, collectively drew little bits of our own journey throughout the day on this apple. And then we buried it in, in the grounds of the Buddhist, uh, of, Camp, of the Buddhist centre. Um, and, and that was very much about life and death and rebirth. Um, we've also planted seeds at the end of the journey before. Um, when we did a, a ritual with Osiris and again about renewal and that was the same as a ritual that people used to do in ancient Egypt so when they were honoring Osiris they would plant seeds so we did this we reenacted an ancient ritual and this is all about interaction so all the different things that I like to do they're all um, the main basis for everything is all about the relationship and this intimate feeling with interacting with the energy of the earth. Um, I like to sketch trees and do tree portraits and um, paint trees because I feel close to them at the moment. And it's that sort of interaction. So I'll show you a few pictures of um, things I've done. Or we were talking earlier about, um, about uh, how we feel about um, Sorry, I'm just trying to find it. Uh, there we go. Um, about how we feel about taking photos in the natural world or of rituals and things. And I'm, I'm in two minds about it, but when I'm outside, um, it's really nice to um, be able to then share these things later. So that's a little labyrinth I built near a tree. Um, apparently, is there some way of moving this on? No. Um, and then this is one of my wands being blessed at, um, at Castle Rig Stone Circle by its uh, new owner. Um, and you can see I keep it fairly simple um, and I try to leave the markings of the tree, but then I add something of my own. So this is a little time um, charm because it was particularly relevant to the person that I was making it for. Um, and you can see I left all these markings of the wood on it and it meant something to the person that then um, had it. Um, this is me working with trees with a client. Um, she's consented to have her photo shared and put on my website. So, um, and a lovely picture taken by a friend. Um, and this is us just feeling the energy of the tree and learning to listen and so not just have the emphasis on talking but on listening. Um, this is, I don't know if you can see this mandala but I wanted to show you the base of the tree and how beautiful and big it was. And this is a little mandala that I made at the base. Um, and I'll just show you that mandala a little bit closer up. So I could feel the energy is swirly um, at that point. So um, I wanted to just reflect. And of course, see with the branches of the tree that I was honoring. So, um, and they had this lovely shape already, this swirl. Um, this is a ritual that I've done just to show you an example. So I journeyed for a question. Um, and you can see this is next the corner of my laptop, so I, I keep it very close to my working space, you know, and I, 
I try to blend technology and um, and everything all at once because I try not to make the distinction between what's holy and what isn't really. Um, but you know, a, on another level, I I do I try to honour everything. So this is a feather and a rock that I collected. And this was the question that I was left with because I wasn't journeying for answers, I was journeying for a question. And then I was allowing the answer to appear over a lunar month um, and leaving those there. Um, and I think uh, this is a tree portrait that I made. Um, so I usually sketch them first. I don't know how, how good a picture that is, but it gives you an idea of, of the how intimate it feels to really observe the curves and the branches and the roots and the, and the little scars and circles and things. And then to go back and revisit the tree once I've made a portrait and, um, and really feel like I'm closer to that tree somehow. And that I've honored the tree by making a portrait of it. And, um, and people now um, send me pictures of their favorite trees and I'll, I'll do them a picture. Um, so that's me really. Um, so hopefully I've um, given you some idea of uh, how I see ecotherapy and, and I love the diversity so far of, um, of how we all overlapping and have these different approaches but um, that are all part of a similar thing. Mm, thank you very much, Charlotte. That was great. 